On this week's Fast Track, trying to tackle the dark underside of tourism. The sexual exploitation of children is a massive problem. It has been said by some to be greater than the importation of drugs. Also ahead... The best way to track tigers in the wild and where to find monkeys taking a hot bath. And why tourists in Sweden are prepared to suffer for their art. Yes, I'm tapping it out for Steve Larsson. <laughs> Hello, I'm Fiona Foster. Welcome to the programme. Now, for most of us, going on holiday is a simple enough equation. The holidaymaker has a great time away from their daily routine, while the people at the holiday destination benefit from their tourist dollars. But for millions of children around the world, the arrival of tourists means exploitation and abuse. New technology, low-cost flights to more places, visa-free travel, do-it-yourself booking, all this has made the world a smaller place. Altogether a good thing, you might think, but not necessarily. These are the tourists nobody wants. People who travel abroad to find vulnerable children to sexually exploit. And all these advances have made things easier for them too, fueling the growth in the hidden illegal world of child sex tourism. Years ago, you used to be able to go to magazines. There were certain magazines that existed which were specifically for people with sexual interest in children. Now, it is available on the internet. The internet has afforded the opportunity for people who have deviant interests, in particular for children, to go and source that. This 13-year-old drug-addicted prostitute in Brazil is just one of the estimated two million children around the world caught up in sex tourism. I had more than 10 clients per night. They pay 10 rias, enough for a rock of crack. I've been doing it for so long I don't even think about it. Foreign guys show up. I've been with lots of them. Child sex tourism exists in every part of the world, and when authorities crack down in one place, it simply moves elsewhere. Mark Williams Thomas is a former police detective and a criminologist specialising in child protection issues. The sexual exploitation of children is a massive problem. It has been said by some to be greater than the importation of drugs, and that is how massive this problem is. I can tell you, around every single country, they have a problem with sex tourism, some far greater than others, particularly around India and Cambodia at the moment, and I'm particularly focused around the accessibility to children, and we have identified that orphanages are now a particular area where offenders are going to. The fact that it's a crime which involves more than one country makes it notoriously difficult to tackle, even though over 30 countries now have extraterritorial laws which allow them to prosecute their own citizens for crimes committed abroad. Some countries, like the US and Sweden, have had significantly more success than others. Australia, for example, has based officers in over 30 cities around the world to pursue investigations outside their own borders, while the UK has prosecuted only a handful of cases over the past decade. What seems to work is where countries have put in the specific resources and training and developed teams of trained police officers who are able to go to the countries where the crimes were committed and work with the local police forces and NGOs to really develop a body of evidence to secure uh, successful convictions. In countries that have been traditionally plagued by sex tourists, attempts are being made to fight back but the scale of the problem is daunting. In 2007, UNICEF estimated that between 30 and 35% of all sex workers in the Mekong region of Southeast Asia, which includes Thailand, Cambodia and Vietnam, were aged between 12 and 17. The influx of tourists attracted by big global crowd pullers like the Olympics and football's World Cup can only make things worse for a country. So for somewhere like Brazil, which will play host to both events over the next few years, the need to crack down is urgent. 
Fortaleza, which will be a host city to soccer fans in 2014, has been sending out a strong message to those tourists who come seeking underage sex. Every week, a special armed unit sweeps through the red light district, raiding brothels and motels, arresting sex tourists and taking young prostitutes into care. We've been doing this work for a while, and for the World Cup, we're going to be redoubling our efforts. And it's because of the Cup that we're targeting the kind of tourism that encourages child prostitution. Some of Brazil's underage prostitutes end up in charity-run homes, like this 12-year-old who managed to escape from her pimp. I felt very different. I felt I was losing my childhood. I was only nine years old. Sometimes, if I came back without money for him, it hit me. I was scared. But those who find a safe place to live away from those who want to exploit them are the lucky few. The problem continues to fester all over the world. In many countries, a criminal justice system just isn't in place to be able to deal with it. And in some circumstances where there is a criminal justice system, the criminal justice system are bought, the offender will pay to get out of custody for the charges to be dropped, and that is the end of it. While governments and law enforcement agencies will have to up their game if they're to make more headway, the travel industry also believes it has a part to play. It wants to see more tourism workers act like the staff member of a London hotel who helped bring to justice these leaders of a child prostitution ring by passing on a suspicious note to police. So what is the travel industry trying to do to combat child sex tourism? Well, ECPAT, a global network fighting child exploitation, together with the Association of British Travel Agents, has come up with this online course for travel professionals, which is aimed at heightening their awareness of what to look out for. It could be a sort of stereotypical uh, image of a, of a white Western tourist, you know, in a middle age, to, who seems to be spending time with local children um, in, in an inappropriate manner. Um, and uh, hopefully having this course will mean that the, whoever the member of staff is would, would know what to do, whether it's informing their superior or whether it's informing their local police force. The general message is this, that if you, first of all, there is a problem here, we need to address it. We as an industry can do something about it. It's not a question of spying on your customers, it's a question of spotting warning signs, taking appropriate action, but also doing it in a structured way. The course has been running over a year now, and hundreds of companies have taken it up. But Mark Williams Thomas, for one, would like to see courses like this made mandatory for those in the industry. Those travel companies who are particularly providing travelling to countries that are high risk, then they should put that at the top of their demands and their needs for their people because after all it's safeguarding them as an industry to make sure that they're not participating and, and affecting and allowing sex offenders to travel to their countries. The terrible downside of the low-cost flights and the better communications which have made travel so much easier for us all. Do let us know your thoughts on the subject. We'd love to hear from you at our usual email address. That's fasttracktravel at bbc.co.uk. Now let's have a look at what else is making the news in the world of travel this week. A month on and the snow that brought delays, cancellations and closures to European travellers is still causing a headache for Britain's biggest airport operator. Virgin Atlantic says it won't pay the British Airports Authority the fees it owes until it sees the results of an inquiry into the disruption. BAA has been widely criticised for not resolving the situation at London Heathrow more quickly. Canadians confused about the new visa charges for entry to the United Arab Emirates are now being directed to the government's foreign affairs website. The UAE struck Canada from its list of visa waiver countries, meaning tourists from there have to pay around $250 for a month's spell. Before the end of last month, entry was free. Tensions arose last year when the UAE asked Canada for additional landing rights for their airlines at Canadian airports. Canada said no, and the UAE decided that Canadians now have to pay visa fees. 
So now if you want to go to the UAE and you're Canadian, it will cost you $250 for a one-month, one-time entry visa and $1,000 for a six-month, multiple entry visa and you can only stay for 14 days at a time. It looks like one of China's newest tourist attractions is pouring cold water all over its rivals. The gigantic Three Gorges Dam, only finished in 2009, attracted almost one and a half million tourists last year, according to local sources. That's said to be up 26% on the year before, and thanks due largely to visits from cruise ships. The dam is the biggest industrial attraction in the country. And it appears luggage fees upset you more than any other payment you make at the airport. The Consumer Travel Alliance, based in the US, surveyed a thousand passengers and more than half said they hated paying to check in their bags the most. 20% said they missed the free meal more than anything else, with roughly the same amount saying they'd like to return to the days when you could always reserve a specific seat. Stay with us, because coming up after the break, how the girl with the dragon tattoo is making her mark on Swedish tourism. Money, 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 must be funny in the rich man's world. Road trip is a very basic route planner that, fingers crossed, gets you from A to B without taking you via C, F, M and W. It's absolutely comprehensive, so if you're off to Angola or Turkmenistan, then it'll still be useful. Type in your destinations and it gives you step-by-step -step directions. Getting from A to B is also what rail team's all about, this time by train though, and it's all very intuitive. Tap in a station anywhere in Europe, tap in another station anywhere in Europe, and you're all set. Saves you having to remember the Swedish for when's the next train to Denmark. I'm Michelle Yana Chan, and this is Fast Track's Insider Guide with my top travel tips. Jigo Kodani in Japan becomes a hot spot this time of year. Famed for the macaque monkeys which bathe in the area's natural hot springs, their behaviour is fascinating to witness. At the Snow Monkey Park, the macaques have even been known to make snowballs. Just down river, enjoy the hot baths. Here called onsens in the area of Shibuyudanaka, with its narrow streets and traditional ryokan guesthouses. And if you fancy hitting the slopes afterwards, head up to Shigakogen Ski Resort, less than an hour away by bus. In Tasmania, the Museum of Old and New Art opens this month in a winery outside the state capital Hobart, becoming the largest private art museum in Australia. There'll be work by Damien Hurst, Chris Ophelia and Sidney Nolan. It's free and accessible via a 40-minute catamaran service from Hobart's waterfront. Just prior to opening is the Festival of Music and Art from January 14th through 20th, with Philip Glass, Grinderman and The Next performing. 
this would be my favourite place to be at this time of year. Also check out the new Art Bikes, a bicycle scheme launching in Hobart, allowing visitors to pedal free of charge between the city's cultural hotspots. Well, I'm just back from Madhya Pradesh in central India at the start of the season for tracking tigers in the wild. It's a beautiful time of year to visit because the land is lush, but the thick vegetation makes it tough to spot these elusive animals. I've seen tourists starting from wow and crying up to oh my god after looking at this creature because it's a thing uh, they want to do in their lifetime, just see one creature. That was Olwyn D'Souza, my guide in Bandhavgarh National Park, which has one of the country's highest concentrations of tigers, and I had the most success from the back of an elephant. Not only can you head off road, but the tigers prefer the company of elephants to tourist vehicles. No great surprise, perhaps. Well, staying in India, look out for the five-day Jaipur Literature Festival, starting January 21st, with luminaries such as Orhan Pamuk, J.M. Kurtzi and Kiran Desai. There'll be readings, literary lunches, debates and performances in the city's Diggy Palace. The festival's free and open to all. Immediately following the event in Rajasthan, Gaul in Sri Lanka hosts its literary festival, which this year will have a focus on Malaysian writers, poets and chefs. There'll be picnics and tea parties, music and poetry readings. In New Zealand, the Bay of Islands Sailing Week begins January 18th, just north of Auckland, with some outstanding racing events across 10 divisions. Back in the city on the last day of January, the Auckland Anniversary Weekend Regatta takes place with a tugboat parade, canoeing contests, even radio-controlled boating events. But the serious yachties will be watching the prestigious races in Waitemata Harbour. And a couple days later is Sail Auckland, New Zealand's premier Olympic class event, which will take place for the first time on the city's North Shore. Until February 17th, China will be hosting the Harbin International Ice and Snow Sculpture Festival in the northeast of the country. Artists cut an entire themed city from ice blocks from the Songhua River. And there's also an ice sculpture contest at Jowlin Park, with participants competing from all over the world. By day, visitors can watch the sculptors chipping away. By night, their works of art are lit up in neon colours. Remember, on February 3rd, it's Chinese New Year. After a year of the tiger, we enter the year of the rabbit. From fireworks in Hong Kong's Victoria Harbour, to dragon dances in Pingyao, to the temple fairs of Beijing, wherever you are, Xinyan Kuai Le. Thanks for checking in with my Insider Guide. Until next time, happy travelling. Michelle Yanachan counting down to the year of the rabbit and yet another reason to party. And some other people with good reason to celebrate are the Swedish Tourist Board. The enormous popularity of the novels of the late Stieg Larsson has spawned a new tourism niche. Literary fans have been descending on the capital to follow in the footsteps of his crime-fighting characters, immortalised in the Millennium Book Trilogy and now the Dragon Tattoo films. Carmen Roberts has been taking a walk on the seedy side of Stockholm. Stockholm, a vibrant modern city famous for producing sleek designs, edgy fashion and a world-class nightlife. It's also the setting for one of the world's best-selling books. The unmissable final chapter. An anorexic computer hacker with a multitude of tattoos and piercings is the unlikely heroine in the Stieg Larsson Millennium Trilogy, a literary success that sold more than 46 million copies worldwide. Dragon tattoo. Most tourists will come to Old Town or Gamla Stan, a chocolate box island with 380 historic buildings. But it hardly rates a mention in the Stieg Larsson books. One of the very few times Stieg Larsson actually mentions old towns in the trilogy is when he is telling us about how Dragan Amansky, who owns the security company, um, gets to know Lisbeth Salanda. Only 40 years ago, Sodomalm, or the South Island, was considered a poor area. Now it's trendy and buzzing with artists and the odd fictional character on the hunt for a murderer or being chased by thugs. This is actually where our official tour starts, just here on Bellman's Garten number one. And we're standing just outside of the building of Michael Blomquist, where he purchased an apartment around the turn of the millennium 
on the uppermost floor of the red building you see over there. It's a tour that hints at an underbelly of Sweden that's not been on display before. But it's captured brilliantly in the books of Stieg Larsson and now the films, and many people say it's done as much for the international Swedish image as the emergence of ABBA. Money, 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 must be funny. Has everybody read the novels of uh, Stieg Larsson? Every Saturday, hordes of international visitors meet at the book's protagonist, Mikhail Blomqvist's house, to embark on a two-hour tour that costs less than 20 US dollars. In September one evening, I read Millennium and decided to go to Stockholm in winter. And so I go to my laptop, book the tickets, and here I am. I've read his first two novels, and I thought they were super interesting. So coming to Sweden was the perfect time to do the Millennium tour. Okay. And even in this weather, you're still doing it? <laughs> even in this weather, when I can't feel my toes or fingers. Tuffing it out or taking your time, there are many ways to see Stieg Larsson's Stockholm. And if you want to tailor make your own tour, you can just pick up a millennium map from any tourist shop. They're 40 Swedish kroner, that's roughly five or six US dollars, and set off at your own pace. The map leads me to Farnen, a 100 year old tavern, and also the place where Elizabeth Salander hangs out with a lesbian rock band. Oh, and they do great traditional Swedish meatballs. English people, Germans, American, it's a lot of people coming here. About to have read the book, Stieg Larsson. It's good, it's amazing. Good for business. It's very good for business, yeah. Not on the map, I happen to stumble on a nearby cafe where Hollywood has also been filming for the American remake of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, starring Daniel Craig. The City Museum has a modest exhibition that's soon to expand, featuring a set from the Swedish film, as well as a photographic display. The island of Kungsholmen is most famous for the Stockholm City Hall, where the Nobel Prize banquet is held. But in the books, you'll find this is the home of all the secret police and corrupt industrialists. To cap off a long day, head back to Hornsgarten, one of the biggest shopping streets in Sodermalm, and settle in for a drink at Melkvist Coffee Bar, where the author himself hung out not so many years ago. Carmen Roberts following in the fictional footsteps of Stieg Larsson. And it's time for us to hot foot it too, I'm afraid, because that's all we've got time for this week. Do join us next time if you can, though, when Rajan will be investigating whether one-stop online shopping for plane tickets could be about to get more difficult, as airlines and web travel agents lock horns. And don't forget, you can keep up to date with the latest travel news at our website at bbc.com forward slash fast track and on our Facebook page. But until next time, from me, Fiona Foster, and the rest of the Fast Track team, it's goodbye. <laughs>